I've shown you pictures of our, our dog Daisy before just because dogs give you so many sermon illustrations. Um, and we normally, we love our dog Daisy most days. There's some days we don't. Uh, we ran into a vet uh, we were t- while we were camping a month ago or so, and we were talking about our dogs, and he was, we kind of been kept being told they'll settle down about a year and a half, two years, and then this vet was like, oh, yeah, we didn't even ask him. He's like, those dogs start getting some sense when they're about three and a half or four years old. It's like, great, we're just now at two years. We've got two more years of this, this coming from a vet. Um, and sometimes she's really smart. I mean, she's a smart dog, and we'll talk about how smart she is. But like any dog, sometimes she's really dumb. Uh, and these random moments. And one of the ways that she's kind of dumb is we can trap her in a room. Because she's so crazy, there are certain areas of the house that she can't go into because of what she'll destroy. So we trap her in certain rooms. And we can trap her with a board about that big. Mom and dad do it at their house too. They keep her out of the kitchen. When you want to keep her in a room, all takes the board about that big. Now, obviously, this is an athletic dog. She could jump that board easily, but she won't. In fact, she won't even go near the board. She's kind of scared of the board. She, if her ball goes up against the board, she won't even go near it. And she will not jump that board. In our backyard, we've got a, a white fence that's about this high. And I think if she ran, she could jump that thing too. But she wouldn't even think about trying that. It doesn't take much to trick her into thinking that she cannot escape. I mean, all it takes. A little board that big. And she thinks she's stuck and she can't escape. Isn't it funny? Not funny. Isn't it strange? How sin does something similar to us? I think sin gets us to think that that we can't escape. Now, we know that we have freedom in Christ. We know that that God has given us or God can can break us free from those chains. But, man, sometimes we just don't believe it. Sometimes I think we don't even want to get out from those chains. But instead of believing that the struggle will never go away, and isn't that true? We're going to struggle with sin. The struggle with sin won't go away. 
I think Satan gets us to believe that and accept that being enslaved to sin is normal. Sometimes we accept that being enslaved to sin is normal. Now, be, struggling with sin is normal. But I don't think it's the case that being enslaved to sin as followers of Jesus is normal. It shouldn't be. Like, you see that on the screen. It's like, well, of course that's wrong. Of course that's not the case. But sometimes we accept it as normal. As Paul travels around from city to city, it's really amazing to me that in every city, there seems to be something different that people are enslaved to. Because every culture has those sorts of things that, that enslave people. And every place he goes, he addresses those things. When he comes into Ephesus in Acts chapter 19, he's coming into one of the most important cities in the ancient world. Some would argue it was the most important city in the most, one of the most significant and prosperous provinces in all of the Roman Empire, in Asia Minor. So Asia Minor is significant. It's, it's wealthier than some of the other ones. And Ephesus is the key city. Big, important city. Estimates the population up to 200,000, which is huge in the ancient world. Big theater hosted or could hold 20,000 people. That'll come into play next week in Acts chapter 19. The point here is this is a big, significant, fairly prosperous city. But it had a couple of characteristics about it that enslaved people. First of all, it was a center for learning the magical arts. That sounds kind of weird in our, from our perspective today, but if you wanted to learn sorcery or magic, Ephesus was one of the main places in the ancient world to do that. For the Harry Potter fans, think of it as the Hogwarts of the ancient world, all right? In Harry Potter, if you're going to learn the magical arts, where are you going to go? You're going to go to Hogwarts. In the ancient world, for some folks, if you're going to learn sorcery, you would go to Ephesus. It also was home to one of the seven wonders of the ancient world, the temple to the goddess Artemis. Some older translations say Diana, but Artemis is the Greek word and the Greek goddess. And she was famous all over the Mediterranean world. In fact, if, you're, if you have your Bibles open to Acts chapter 19, if you skip over to verse the end of verse 27, they're talking about Artemis, and it says that about her, she whom all Asia and the world worship. And the reason they could say the whole world worshiped Artemis is because in the Mediterranean world, there were dozens of other satellite temples. Like, this is the main temple. You've got all sorts of satellite temples all throughout the Mediterranean rim, which means she's a big deal. And so they're enslaved to idolatry as well. And in the middle of all this, Paul comes in with the gospel. What's going to happen? What's going to happen? Look at, verse, look at verse 10. The text tells us what happens. Verse 10, this continued for two years, Paul preaching the word, so that all the residents of Asia heard the word of the Lord, both Jews and Greeks. And then verse 20, so the word of the Lord continued to increase and prevail mightily. The gospel is unstoppable even in a place as pagan as Ephesus. How? What happens in Ephesus that causes such incredible stuff to happen? Well, let's, let's look at the story together. We're picking up in verse 8. Now, the first seven verses, Paul's been in Ephesus for a little while, and he's dealt with these disciples we talked about last week. Verse 8, and he entered the synagogue. Remember, when Paul goes in a new place, he goes to the Jews first, usually. Goes to the Jewish synagogue and for three months spoke boldly, reasoning and persuading them about the kingdom of God. Nothing abnormal there. But when some became stubborn and continued in unbelief, speaking evil of the way before the congregation, so some of the Jews get angry about it and they start talking bad about Paul and about the gospel, Paul says, I've, I've had enough of this, I'll move on. He withdrew from them and took the disciples with him, reasoning daily in the hall of Tyrannus. I think it's important to remember and learn from Paul here that sometimes it's okay to move on when others won't listen I think we can get so focused on certain people in our lives and we want so badly for them to hear the gospel that we forget that sometimes it's okay to, to let off the gas a little bit. Do we give up on them? Of course not. Never. But maybe they need some space. Maybe, maybe you need some space because we get so amped up about it and Paul just says, okay, in this case, we're going to give them some space. They clearly are not welcome. Does Paul give up on the Jews? Never. Never, he loves them. But in this case, he's going to give them some space and he goes somewhere else. This hall of Tyrannus. You know what we know about the hall of Tyrannus? Nothing really. We all, apparently, some sort of lecture hall that this guy named Tyrannus apparently owned. All right? So he goes there and he preaches the gospel there. This continued for two years. 
daily. So Paul's in this lecture hall for two years every day preaching the word of God so that all the residents of Asia heard the word of the Lord, both Jews and Greeks. That's really cool because this isn't just about all of Ephesus here and all of Asia. So here's a map. You see Ephesus right there in the middle with that circle around it. There's all sorts of cities around this, this city of, of Ephesus. And because Ephesus is so important, people would think of it like as a Nashville or a Memphis or bigger than that really in the ancient world where people from all other areas would come for work or come for things that they needed to buy. And Paul gets to reach all those people. And where do those people go back to? Back to their hometowns. And so the way this works is the reason all of Asia heard the gospel is because all these people are coming to Ephesus. They're here in Paul and they're going back. So... Best we know, Paul never went to Colossae or Laodicea or Hierapolis. But were there churches in those places? I mean, Paul wrote the book of Colossians. And apparently this guy named Epaphras heard from Paul in Ephesus, went back to Colossae. Those seven churches of Asia that John writes to in Revelation, Paul didn't go to all those places. How'd they hear the word? Well, maybe it was during these two years when Paul preaches in Ephesus and the gospel spreads to, to all of Asia. Paul would say in, in 1 Corinthians 16, 8 and 9, he was in Ephesus when he wrote this, and he stays in Ephesus for three total years, we'll say in chapter 20. He says, but I will stay in Ephesus until Pentecost, for a wide door for effective work is open to me, and there are many adversaries. So even elsewhere, it's obvious that Paul had a huge opportunity to preach the gospel in Ephesus, and the gospel spreading rapidly. So imagine you're in Ephesus during this time period. It's exciting But it had to be a little scary, too. I mean, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 16, there's many adversaries. Watch what happens next. Verse 11. And God was doing extraordinary miracles by the hands of Paul, so that even handkerchiefs or aprons that had touched his skin were carried away to the sick. So if if Paul's doing any sort of hard labor or work there, and we don't know exactly what he's doing, this may have been something that he wore, and they would take it away, and their diseases left them, and the evil spirits came out of them. Some incredible mirac- miracles are occurring in Ephesus. Now, again, remember, where are we? We're in a city that is known to be a center for the magical arts. You think anybody took notice of the miracles and thought, oh, man, I'd, if, if I could do that, we could, we could really make some money here. We could we'd go a long ways. Watch what some folks do. Verse 13 then some of the itinerant Jewish exorcists. Who's being enslaved by the sorcery of, in Ephesus? Is it just the pagans? No, even Jewish people. Believers in God have been sucked in by this sorcery, and they're buying into this itinerant Jewish exorcist. There's nothing to say in this text that these like are legitimate exorcists, right? There's no reason to believe that in this text. We don't know for sure undertook to invoke the name of the Lord Jesus over those who had evil spirits, saying, I adjure you by the Jesus whom Paul proclaims. So they see, man, if this Jesus has all this power, maybe we can do some miracles by the name of Jesus. Maybe this is some real sorcery that we can get our hands on. Verse 14, seven sons of a Jewish high priest named Sceva were doing. So apparently a bunch of guys going around saying, I'm trying to do miracles in the name of Jesus. Now who's this Jewish high priest named Sceva? There's a name for your kids someday, Skiva. That's a great one. This is not a legitimate high priest. Where did the high priest live? Jerusalem, right? But in, apparently, and there's some evidence outside of Scripture, there were actually some guys who claimed to be a Jewish high priest living elsewhere. So these guys are living all sorts of lies. These are fake Jewish exorcists and a fake Jewish high priest just living all sorts of lies. But they're thinking, all right, we're going to cast out some demons, see what happens. And if you've never heard this story before, if this is new for you, this is a good one, and it's okay to smile at it, what happens to these these guys who are faking it. So they try to cast out a demon, verse 15, but the evil spirit answered them, Jesus I know, and Paul I recognized, but who are you? Can you imagine an evil spirit saying that to you? And the man in whom was the evil spirit leaped on them, mastered all of them, that means he beat them up. And overpowered them so that they fled out of that house naked and wounded. Boy, there's a scene. Can you imagine that scene? You think that got around? Look at the next verse. Verse 17. And this became known to all the residents of Ephesus, both Jews and Greeks. I'd imagine so. Something like that happens. That kind of word travels fast. And fear fell upon them all. And the name of the Lord Jesus was extolled. So the result 
of what happens here is that more people are coming to believe in Jesus and praise Jesus. Now watch what happens. Here's the key. You've got a culture, a city that is enslaved by multiple factors, by sorcery, by idolatry. And watch what they do when they come to believe in Jesus. Verse 18, also many of those who were now believers came confessing and divulging their practices. And a number of those who had practiced magic arts brought their books together and burned them in the sight of all. You see that? As a result of their belief in Jesus and obvious repentance, they say, okay, we're done with this. Now we read they came confessing and divulging their practices. We just think, well, that means they confessed their sins, right? Probably not. What that probably means is they took their magical incantations and spoke them publicly. What happens to a, if you believe in magic, like what happens to a magical incantation if you say it out loud for others to hear it? It loses its power. And so they had these, these magical incantations that they kept secret. Even today, people who know magic is just sleight of hand. They keep their secrets. They, kept, they guarded their secrets closely. And to divulge that was to render them useless. Isn't that wild? And so they all come and they publicly confess their, their magical spells and Leave them, it's in their mind, at least, it leaves them useless. And then they burn all of their magic books. Now, here's another, one more little cool historical detail. In Ephesus, history indicates that these aren't like magical books like we would think of them. These were little scrolls, little tiny scrolls that they would wear in amulets around their neck. And they would carry them with them everywhere they would go. They would, of course, use those as magic. They would view them as protection And so apparently what they do is they take, it was a tradition in Ephesus to wear these little amulets with these little scrolls. They took those scrolls and they burn them. All these believers burn them. It says it was worth 50,000 pieces of silver. If if you have a study Bible, it might give you a number in there what that was worth. Estimates are somewhere on the low end around $6 million worth is what these little scrolls were worth. Isn't Isn't that incredible? That... They're that serious about breaking free from this that they're burning things deeply, deeply valuable to them. And watch how this wraps up. It says in verse, end of verse 19, and they counted the value of them, found it came to 50,000 pieces of silver. Verse 20, so the word of the Lord continued to increase and prevail mightily. So what happens here that causes such a strong reaction to the gospel where people are willing to give up what mattered so deeply to them, what they had been enslaved to culturally for years. Now, here's the deal. I get that. It's like we read this and we're like, oh, they were enslaved to the sorcery? How silly is that? Like that doesn't doesn't say anything to us. But people throughout the world historically and even today are enslaved by the belief that the spirit world has control over them or their ancestors have control over them or the witch doctor or the shaman is in control. And so this isn't just something from the ancient world. Still today, people will struggle with this and are enslaved by this. But here's, I think, what what happens here that I think speaks to all of us regardless of our circumstance. Here it is. The gospel frees us from what holds us in bondage. Whatever holds you in bondage, whatever held them in bondage, sorcery, idolatry, the gospel frees us from that. Wherever Paul goes, he addresses the thing that holds them in bondage. Let me add to this. The gospel doesn't just free us from what holds us in bondage, but it even frees us from the chains of our own priorities. And let me explain what I mean by this. Because you might look at your life right now and say, well, I'm not held in bondage to anything. Could it be that there are good things in your life that are priorities in your life that you're controlled by? You ever known somebody that was held in bondage by their work? You call them a, a workaholic, right? See, it's not, just, it's not just things that we think of sins that held us in bondage. It's things that we prioritize that God calls us to do that are good things that can control us. You ever seen anybody held in bondage by the priority of family? We just came off of a three-week series on family and how we can be the kind of families that God wants us to be. But man, family can control us and become more important to us than God. And you can make a long list here of good things that we prioritize and 
sometimes we become enslaved to those things. Now, here's the deal. Everywhere Paul goes, what's he do? He addresses that thing that enslaves him. In Ephesus, he addresses sorcery and idolatry, and apparently people give that up. In Athens, for example, they were enslaved to idolatry. Does Paul address it? Absolutely. He goes to Corinth, and he spent time in Corinth, and will write a letter to the Corinthians, and it's going to emphasize sexual sin throughout, especially that first letter to the Corinthians, because they were enslaved by that. For the Jewish people in Jerusalem, man, he's going to really drive home that they can't be held in bondage by the law and Jewish tradition. Wherever he goes, he addresses what holds people into bondage. So let me just ask you the simple question this morning. This is, this is it. It's really this simple this morning. What is it? That holds you in bondage. You see, because this, we could look at a city like Ephesus or Corinth or Athens and say, yeah, look at all of those non-Christians and how they're held in bondage by sin. And that's right. But I think it's the case that even Christians can be held in bondage because we assume that it's normal to not be able to escape. Kind of like Daisy thinks she can't get out of that room just because there's a little board there. I think sometimes we think we can't escape. So what is it that holds you in bondage? Now, we could make a long list. Let me just throw, up, throw some words up on the screen. Materialism. Money. Can that hold us in bondage? Jesus would say it like this in Matthew chapter 6. You cannot serve two masters. And then he'll add at the end of that verse, you can't serve God and money. Have you ever known somebody? you ever slip into a mode where money controlled you and you were enslaved by it? I mean, sex, that's an obvious one in our culture. What, what holds our culture in bondage? Money and sex would be two major ones, right? And both of those things can hold Christians in bondage. What about relevance? Wanting, to, wanting everybody to think that you're caught up with the times and your monitor, or, or technology and social media. Does that enslave anybody? This past Thursday night at Horizons, we brought in a a well-known national Christian comedian, nationally known. I mean, the real deal, really funny, great guy. We brought him in Thursday night, and it was kind of the last thing that we did. And, and he was great, so funny. But I, I sat behind, sat in the back. I usually sit up front all week. I sat in the back this particular night, and, and the kids were having a blast. But where I was sitting, right in front of me, to the left of me, were, were two teenagers who didn't laugh one single time. I mean, everybody, it was... Everybody was laughing, not these two. They sat there, and they could not stop scrolling. They couldn't stop. And it wasn't just, you know, we all, we all slip into that. You see, it's easy to pick. We're not picking on teenagers, I promise, because you know what? Everybody else, everybody else does it too, right? But in this particular case, they were so enslaved to that, they couldn't even enjoy the moment of having a chance to hear a pretty cool comedian. They couldn't do it because they were enslaved by technology and social media. Sometimes I think we can be enslaved by image, what everybody thinks of us. And that looks a lot of different ways, right? And sometimes that's tied to social media and relativism in our culture, right? That there's, there is no right or wrong and everything is okay. We can buy into that and be enslaved by that. And I know that mental health issues are serious, but sometimes we allow anxiety to to control our lives. And after I made this PowerPoint, well, I just kept thinking of more of these. What about bitterness? Anybody ever let bitterness control their lives? Now, here's the deal. I know we go through some really tough stuff. But sometimes we think we accept holding on to some of this, that we can't escape some of this, as just normal. When in reality, Jesus Christ has set us free from sin. And I'll add this one, even the chains of our own pride. We could put some of this up here. Now, let me tell you the one that I thought of. You know anybody who's enslaved by the priority of their political views and politics and what they think about it and the way they talk about it? I'm convinced that there's some folks that are more concerned about political freedom than they are freedom in Christ. And what happens when we're more concerned about something like that than we are freedom in Christ? We then end up enslaved to this very freedom that we talk about all the time. So I don't know, I don't know what it is for you. What is it that, that holds you in bondage? Here's what 
Paul would say about freedom. Now, in the context of Galatians, he's talking about the old law. And he says to, to Jewish Christians especially, for freedom Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. Again, talking about the old law, but this, could, this fits with anything that we would have put on the screen a minute ago. Whatever it is that holds you down and keeps you in Christ, died so that you could be set free from that. Or he says in Romans chapter 6, we know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing. And that's right after what he says about being buried with him in baptism. So at baptism, we die to the old man and we're raised again to new life. So we, he uses that language again. We're crucified with him so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. For one who has died has been set free from sin. Could that be any clearer that Jesus sets us free? He doesn't eliminate the struggle. We're going to struggle. We've got the help of, of one another. We've got the help of the Spirit and the Word. We've got all sorts of help here. But it's not normal to be enslaved. One more, Romans 6, verse 22. But now that you have been set free from sin and become slaves of God, the fruit you get leads to sanctification and its end, eternal life. So, really I think what I'm trying to do this morning is it's pretty simple. I just want all of us to ask ourselves, and not think about other, it's easy to think about what everybody else is enslaved to, what our culture is enslaved to, and those are interesting and valuable conversations. But as we wrap up, I'm just asking you to think, what is it in your life that maybe still enslaves you? And Jesus wants to set you free. And maybe it's one of these sins, maybe it's something big and obvious, or maybe it's a, just some priority that you've placed above God himself. And now you're enslaved to that good thing that is to be a priority in our lives, but you've, you've elevated it too much. What is it? What is it for you? We'll give you a couple of things to do to, to help you in your battle if you're, if you're enslaved by one of these things. Number one, I think you got to recognize that we are at war. It's really easy to slip into this mode of thinking, well, everything is pretty good. My life is comfortable. Church is nice and good. We're pretty comfortable. And forget that we are in spiritual warfare and Satan is out to destroy us. And he wants nothing more than to enslave us to sin. In our second class, I think we'll read this passage. In fact, let's just do it. Ephesians 6, this is so important. Isn't it interesting who Paul is writing to in Ephesians? The church at Ephesus, right? So a place where people have been enslaved. There's real spiritual warfare there. And he says in verse 10, Finally, be strong in the Lord and the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. We are at war. And it's not a political war. This is, this is spiritual, and it doesn't go away. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all to stand firm, Stand, therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth and having put on the breastplate of righteousness and as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith with which you, want, you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying at all times in the Spirit with all prayer and supplication. We're at war. Don't, don't forget that. If you forget that we're at war, then Satan's, Satan's got you. He's got you enslaved. Number two, trust that God has the power to set you free and that he's given you the help you need to set you free. He's given you a Christian family. We're not in this. You don't ever see anybody go into war by themselves. What happens when somebody goes to war by themselves? It usually doesn't turn out very good. Why is Ukraine begging for help? Because they, they seem to recognize we can't do this on our own. In our spiritual war, we can't do this on our own. And the good news is God has given us a family. And he's given us the word of God and he's given us the spirit which then reminds me of what's brought up at least a couple times in the passage we just read. God's going to help us, but we've got to be disciplined. And so we put on these spiritual armor, or the spiritual armor, and we spend time in the sword of the Spirit, the Word of God, and we are praying, like he talks about in verse 18, 
if you're in bondage to something right now, then, then yeah, God's going to help you get out of it. But you've got to put yourself in a posture where he can help you, and that's by disciplining yourself, by spending time in the Word and in prayer and in fasting and time with other brothers and sisters in Christ. So again, I mean, the question again is just a simple one. What is it? I mean, it's simple, but boy, it takes some self-reflection because our temptation is to think, nah, not me. Not me. What is it that's holding you in bondage this morning? I read a story of a a missionary in, in Central America who was witnessing a baptism, and he watched this, this woman go down to the water at a, a local river, and she was baptized, and, and when she came up out of the water, he saw that she had um, a little amulet that they wear in that culture to ward off evil spirits. And he thought, oh, what, what did the missionary, he was with another missionary, he said, boy, he missed it. How do, how do we proclaim the gospel to this person so that she thinks that she can just, she doesn't, she still needs that. What We've messed this up really bad. I mean, he had all these thoughts immediately go through his mind when she came up out of the water with that magical amulet on. And he said, but when she came up out of the water and walked up on the bank, she ripped it off and she threw it in the river. And he said, never mind on everything I just thought. She did. She did get it. Because the gospel sets us free from all of those things that enslave us. Listen, we live in a culture that's drastically different than that. I'm guessing there's probably not a person in the room who has an amulet that you believe protects you from evil spirits. That's what I'm guessing. But there might be something else. And we're here to help you with that. You don't have to face that alone. God will set you free, and as a family, we'll help you on the journey. And if we can do that in any way at all, why don't you come as we stand and sing together?